you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter 13, Exodus chapter 13. I don't know about you, church, but I just love the Bible, love what we're doing, reading the Bible through this year, and I don't want to make you feel guilty if you're not, but boy, you sure are missing out. Uh, the Bible is an epic tale of God writing a love letter to you and to me. As you're opening to Exodus 13, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I don't like roundabouts and I don't like roadblocks. I get so uh, uh, angry in my spirit when I, I come to a roundabout or a roadblock. I've been tempted to go around the roadblock, but I, I, I know that it's, it's illegal for one, and uh, the risk is probably greater than the inconvenience of the detour. And you know, I was thinking, you know, we have a road, we have a, a roundabout here in Calhoun City. It's called the square. And the thing I don't like about roundabouts is that you don't know which lane you're in anytime you're at a roundabout. Am I in the left lane? Am I in the middle? Is there is there a middle lane? Am I in the in the right lane? But uh, th this is a journey that we all walk through called the journey of roundabouts and roadblocks. I want to talk to you today about that journey. It's the journey of roundabouts and roadblocks. Now, I think it's safe to say that for most of us who are above the age of 10, realize that life does not work out like we had planned, does it? I mean, we, uh, we planned to be drafted number one, but we weren't drafted at all, right? Uh, we planned uh, to to you know, to date that person and, and life would be perfect and it would work out grandiosely, but it did not work out. We planned it, it didn't work out. We expected to get the pay raise, but we got the pay reduction. We, we expected to retire at 65, but here we are at 85, right? It didn't work out like we thought to. It's the journey of roundabouts and roadblocks. Now, if you're here last week, we are 350 years further down the road, all right, after the death of Joseph. We are in the 15th century B.C., and the Pharaoh, we don't know his name, but the, the Pharaoh, he is mad at the Hebrew people because they are exploding in blessings and growth. So what does he do? He says, well, I'm going to kill every firstborn male. And uh, the midwives kind of find a loophole, and it doesn't really work out as planned. And uh, suddenly, you know, this, this couple who have this child realize that there's no hope for their Jewish son. So they put him in a basket down the Nile River. And uh, all of a sudden, this child, he's raised now by the, the Pharaoh's palace, the, the staff. And he's raised as a prince, and his name is Moses. Now, you can't make this stuff up. This will be the guy that will lead God's people to the promised land, all right? So uh, this is the context uh, of, of Exodus 1 through 13. And so Moses has the wealth of a prince, but the, 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 the scriptures say that he was connected to some way to his Jewish roots. Now, we don't know how he found out, all that speculation, but... He observed an Egyptian taskmaster beating a, a Jewish slave, and this made him irate. So Moses murders that taskmaster, all right? So this is roughly, the New Testament says that uh, probably about, you know, 40 years of age. So the first 40 years, Moses was a prince. The next 40, he was a shepherd in the wilderness, and then the last 40, he was leading God's people, and that's where we are today. He is about to lead God's people, and in Exodus chapter 3, it's the turning point. Moses has an encounter with a bush that's on fire, but it's not consumed, and God says, lead my people out of slavery into the promised land. I know Moses is probably questioning his sanity at this point, but he obeys, he submits in spite of the excuses. And, and if you read the text, you, you read, he, he has all these excuses. God, 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 if you want me to be a preacher, if you want me to lead people, I can't talk. I got a speech impediment. God said, 
Who made, who made the mouth? In other words, I've given you all the ability you need in spite of your inability because I've called you to do something. And whatever God calls you to do, he will empower you to do it. So in Exodus 13, uh, this is just fascinating to me, uh, that the, the, the text here, Exodus 13, we'll, we'll look at 13, 14, and 15, but in the text, it gives us three locations where God may lead us to and where God may lead us through. Three locations, all right, you ready? So if you're taking notes, location number one, God may lead us to a roundabout detour. It's the longer route. It's the inefficient route. It's the route that you took that you never want to take again is the detour. That's where he led his people. Exodus 13, we'll look at verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, which, by the way, that was a direct shot, although that was, what, near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. See, God knew what they didn't know. That, I mean, that, when you go somewhere, you try to go as straight as possible. But God knew there would be a wreck. God knew there would be a war. God knew there would be discouragement. They, he knew there would be dismay. So he created a detour. And the detour was for their protection. Don't miss that. The detour was for their protection because he knew if they went through Philistia, they would have got so discouraged, they would have, listen, they would have rather had been enslaved than free. And that's a word for many of you today because many of you, you, if you're honest, you realize that freedom may cost you more than you're willing to pay. And if they would have walked through Philistia, they would have had to pay more than they were willing to pay. And God knew it, so he created the detour. But, but, but let's continue reading in verse 18. God led the people around by the way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. That's the roundabout. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. See, God is concerned more with your growing. God is concerned more with your obedience. God is concerned more with your discipleship. God is concerned more with you walking with him than he is about the destination he has for you. We're all about the destination. Where am I going? And when am I going to get there? I'm impatient. But God is doing something in the journey that grows us. And here's a practical uh, implication for us. What looks like a problem for us may be protection from God. May actually be protection from God. That, that's, that's what problems may be. God, God says this is protecting you from something you don't even see yet. If you would have retired early, you would not have been obedient. If you would have married him, you would not have been faithful now. If you got the pay raise instead of the pay reduction, you would still be weak in your faith. Do you see it? It's the detour. Looking back, we probably realized why we took the detour. It's just frustrating in the moment because nobody wants to be in the wilderness because the wilderness is the boot camp. You know what I'm talking about, the boot camp? I've never been to boot camp. I've heard about boot camp. Boot camp is probably not something I want to go to, but I have been to two-a-days, and two-a-days may be similar. I don't know. I don't want to offend anybody that's been to boot camp, but I've been to two-a-days. And uh, two-a-days, coaches will tell you that if, if you don't make it through two-a-days, it's probably going to be, uh, it's probably not going to work out for you. And, and if the team as a whole d does not do very well in two-a-days, they're probably in for a long season, how you tackle two-a-days. Players don't know. Players don't get it. Players just want to make it out alive each day, right? They're at two-a-days. But, but they're, they're, they're training. They're growing. They're in the wilderness. It's the place of provision. It's, it's the place of, of, of finding out who you 
really are. It's protecting. It's providing. And listen, not in spite of the detour, but because of the detour. And, and, and that's the difference. So the detour protects and provides what otherwise could not be experienced. Now look at verse 20. So they moved from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them day, this is, this is so cool, in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light. And they might travel by day and by night. So before you have Siri and the iPhone, you've got the Shekinah glory of God. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. All right, that's pretty obvious, all right? Much better than Siri, bless her heart. Verse 22, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart before the people. These were cosmic road signs in the sky. Very obvious. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking what I'm thinking. Man, I, I really wish that God would lead me that way. I mean, I think I, I, I wish he had you know, in, in the clouds, just spell out what I need to do, where I need to go. You know, I, I just really wish it would be that clear. So there's good news and there's bad news. You ready? The bad news is that, well, even though God could do that, and he may do that, I'm not negating if he will, but the bad news is that he's probably not going to do that. And the reason he's not going to do that is because of the good news. You ready for good news? John 15 says that, that Jesus says that it, it's going to be more clear than, than a pillar of cloud by day and, and fire by night. It, it's much more clear. You've got an advocate. You've got a helper. His name is the Holy Spirit. He will lead you through any detour necessary. So he is with you all day, every day. It's as clear as day. An advocate will come, and this advocate, by the way, is the reason you're a believer, because he has called you to himself. He's that kind of helper, the paraclete's what we call him. He leads us through life's roundabout detours, and, and that, that's the, the quote of my very first sermon when I was, I think, a 10th grader. It was the worst sermon I've ever preached in my life. It was seven minutes long, and I was so nervous. But here's a quote that I use. Where God guides, he provides. Where God guides, he provides. Don't be discouraged. God may lead us to roundabout detours. That's number one. Number two, God may lead us through a roadblock dead end. A roadblock, dead end. Exodus 14, one chapter, flip over, Exodus 14. have a couple words that we may struggle with here in a minute, so bear with me and pray for me. Uh, Exodus 14, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahithroth. I don't know if I said that right. You know, you can go to YouTube and figure out uh, how to pronunciate these words in the original language. Uh, Pahahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Belzephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea, for Pharaoh will say to the people, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has, what? Shut them in. Verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that what? I am the Lord. That's what it's about, by the way. I am the Lord. And they did so. Now, I can't imagine, but let's just imagine for a moment that you, along with potentially millions of other people on the shores of the Red Sea, mountains to your left and to your right, the Red Sea before you, Pharaoh's army, behind you, God, what should I do? You, you've led me here, and I know you've done incredible things in, in, in my life, and I've seen you do miracles, but uh, even this miracle is too big for you. Whew. And we're about to go to sleep, and I don't know what we're going to wake up to. And now there's approximately 3 million people that will probably die 
at the sword of Pharaoh. They are in panic mode. You ever been in panic mode? You're like, oh. And sometimes we're just kind of jittery, we're stressed, we're anxious. We don't get out of bed, we're depressed, in panic mode. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about panic mode. Uh, I, I, I love this quote. Um, Corey Ten Boom, she, she quoted this after she was in prison in a Nazi concentration camp. She said, there is no panic in heaven. Isn't that good? Just rest in that right now. There's no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. She helped Jews escape from these camps, and she ended up in this camp, and she saw it as God's plan. God only has plans. I'm pretty sure she felt like she was at a dead end. Pretty sure that God's people felt like they were at a dead end. But listen to what God tells Moses to do at this dead end. Look at what he says in verse 16. Lift up your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. Now, it almost reads, and I apologize for saying this, but it reads like it's, it's the instruction manual on the back of a Drano bottle. It's, it's lackluster. But imagine seeing this, and imagine Moses hearing the instructions. I thought I was hallucinating at the bush. Now I know I'm hallucinating. God, you want me to do what? That's the cynical Moses, but the faithful Moses knows, God, I've seen you. I know you have been faithful. I know you have led me here. And if you can lead me here, you can lead us there. So what does Moses do? He's obedient. And so verse 17 says, I will harden the hearts of Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. I will get the glory, there, there, there it is again, glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts and uh, the religion that he believes, his chariots, his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen, God always gets the glory, and he uses hardened hearts to do it. I can't, I, I can't fully explain this, but can you imagine your father? Number one, how hard does your heart have to be to have been through all of those plagues and then go after God's people and then walking on dry ground in the Red Sea with waves around you, how hard does your heart have to be? And in the same way that when they saw those waves walking on that dry ground, and those waves began to crash, in that instant, they realized, you know what? This is the one true living God. And God received the glory God received the glory. In the same way that there are atheists today, agnostics, and people who mock God, guess what? He's going to get the glory. God's Word says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't want to be on that side of the knee. I don't want to mock God and find out how he receives the glory. Pharaoh and his army, they did. So God may lead you to a roundabout detour. Number two, God may lead us through a roadblock dead end. And so you, you kind of fast forward the next chapter, and you know what they do after they make it through and Pharaoh's army, they, they are completely wiped out. They throw a worship service. Now, this, this was not, I don't want to offend anybody. But uh, this was not like a Baptist church service. What do you mean? Well, they, they didn't look at me strange, and they didn't feel void of anything. 
They, they weren't cold. They weren't hard hearted. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dissing you. I know you were a very lively crew at First Baptist Calhoun City. But, uh, but most Baptist churches are very, hmm, okay, we're close to Catholic. Uh, we're, we're real stoic. Uh, this was not one of those services. Listen, the women started dancing. Oh, boy. We might kick them out of our church for that happened. The women got the tambourines, and they had a worship service. That was day one. But you look at the very next verse. Listen, the very next verse. You know what happened? They got thirsty, couldn't find some water, and they start complaining. Ha. I don't know, if y- y'all aren't this way, but some people, they praise God on Sunday, but when they leave church, let me tell you about what I need to complain about. All right, so I, I don't want to get ahead, but uh, let, so God may lead us through a, round, a, a roadblock, a roundabout roadblock, and number three, God may lead us to a rainless drought. He's done that. He will do that. God may lead us to a, rain, a rainless drought. Look at Exodus 15. Verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. They went from dancing to disappointment. They went from worship to worry, from choruses to complaining. I know this is not you, but this is, you know, God's people. This is, this is their struggle. Uh, ver- verse 23, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled. I'm going to give you permission to do something that you probably don't feel like you have ever been permission, given that permission to do. All right, so just, just one and only time. Look at your neighbor and say, quit grumbling. Quit grumbling. Now, some of y'all husbands are getting way too excited about this. Y'all should not be getting excited about this. Why did you automatically look to your wife? All right, that's my question. Uh, quit grumbling. All right, let, let, let me keep going before y'all boo me off stage here. Um, so God's people reached a place of bitterness and barrenness, and, and they started grumbling. Now, let me unpack what complaining is. You ready? Complaining is a coping mechanism for distrusting the plan of God. That's what it is. I mean, yeah, we could talk a lot further about that, but at the end of the day, it's a coping mechanism for distrusting God's plan. It, it's a front for pent-up stress and frustration. It's a front for insecurity and seeking validation. That's what complaining is. So the next time you hear somebody complaining, you just ask them why they're so insecure and why they don't trust the plan of God. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. That would not be good for your friendship, but that's what complaining is. Verse 25, he cried out to the Lord, Moses, and the Lord showed him a log. Now, this log is a tree. It is the provision. The provision was there. But the people could not see the provision because they were complaining. It was there the whole time. They couldn't see it because they were complaining. God provided. How did he provide? He showed him a log and threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. I'm not big into club soda. My wife is. It's weird. It's strange. I don't like it. But it went from club soda to cream soda. It was sweet. No longer bitter. It was exactly what they needed to quench their thirst. Now, I'm not here to punt to crazy prophecies, but I will let you in on a pastor who I looked up, a preacher who I look up to and read quite a bit. His name is Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about this very instance. He says, I do know a tree if put into the soul will sweeten all of its thoughts and desires. And Jesus knows that tree, and the tree whereon he died, that tree's Calvary. 
So you see that the tree in the wilderness of Shur is the tree of Mount Calvary. Life without Christ is bitter as the waters of Marah. But the tree of Calvary is the ultimate provisional tree, the tree that provides a quench that will never thirst again. You know, when I, when I read the book of Exodus, I, there's this one word that just keeps coming to mind. That God's doing a work in his people, and that work is really encapsulated by one word. And that word is focus. Word is focus. They, they, they quit focusing on the deliverer, and they started focusing on the dead end. They, they, they started focusing on the drought, not the, the deliverer. They, they, they focus on the detour. And God had a way of reshifting their focus. So I was thinking about this last night. I am uh, keeping my four-year-old Baxter for the rest of the day. And uh, he has fallen in love with the care center, which is great for me because it costs nothing. We can go to the care center. He can ride his bike. I can pretend like I'm working out. You know, it, it's, it's all good. Uh, Baxter was riding his bike, and, and I, I start chasing him, you know, from behind. And, and he just thinks it's funny. And then w when I get in front of him, he says, Daddy, slow down, slow down. So, you know, you know the competition's not fair. I let him win. And so, uh, so I try to stick right behind him. But when, when I'm behind him about 10 or 15 feet, he thinks it's great because he's winning the race. But he looks back and he starts laughing. Well, when he does that, every time he does it, he hits a wall. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he hits the basketball goal. And son, Baxter, don't look at me. Look forward. Look to where you're going. He's losing focus on what he needs to be focused on. And it's so true for us today. Because you're, you're focused on the detour. You're focused on the dead end. You're focused on the drought. When you need to be focused on the deliverer. And what we learn from Charles Spurgeon is that Moses, huh, he's not the ultimate deliverer. Jesus is the greater Moses. Jesus is the greatest deliverer. Deliver for what? Not out of your proverbial captivity, but in your real captivity of sin. He has set you free from the bondage of your sin. That's why he's the greatest Moses. Focus on the deliverer, not your drought, not your detour, and not your dead end. Can you pray with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed, just one simple question as we begin our invitation time. One question. What are you enslaved to? Maybe, maybe another way to ask the question is this. Who are you enslaved to? Are, are, are you still in bondage in Egypt? Or are you walking in the freedom that you've been set free from in Christ? Will you have a drought? Yeah, you'll have a drought. Will you hit a dead end? Yeah, you'll hit a dead end. But you're focused on your deliverer. See, some of you, <laughs> you've, you've, you've witnessed a miracle, but, but you're, you're still complaining, you're still grumbling because you're still enslaved to your sin. And today, you need to be liberated. And the only way you can be liberated is to focus on the greater Moses. His name is Jesus. 
who died on a cross to deliver you from your sin to enjoy God's salvation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the exodus. And in the same way that your people were set free from slavery, we have been set free from sin's slavery. I pray that you would encourage us to fix and focus our eyes on Jesus, the greater Moses, the ultimate deliverer, so we can be obedient to where you would have us to go. Give us the courage to respond. Christ, I pray. Amen.